This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Chapter 10 of the course notes, DCF techniques. Now in the earlier lectures, uh, what we've already done, we've revised net present value calculations with a small example, but almost certain to be asked, desperately important. Uh, we also revised uh, the standard internal rate of return calculation, which you've done in previous exams. Um, and we did finish off that session by stating why we might be interested in the internal rate of return, uh, but equally uh, the fact that there are problems with it. And I said at the end of the um, second lecture that because of the problems, uh, your examiner has suggested an alternative calculation, something called the modified internal rate of return. which, as you'll see, is actually very quick and is much easier than the ordinary internal rate of return. However, to explain it, uh, we're going to do example 3 in the notes, which is page 49. But as you'll see, although there is space there, we're going to use the same figures as we had in example 1. So if you've not been through the previous two examples, do make sure you, <clears throat> you go through them and that you're happy with them. If you need, listen to the previous two lectures on this chapter. Anyway, let's look at modified internal rate of return. Now, if you look back at example one, in example one, <coughs> excuse me, we set up the cash flows, we discounted at the cost of capital, which was 10%, remember, and we ended up with a net present value of 258. It was positive, we accept. We then went on in the second uh, lecture, or the second example, to calculate the internal rate of return. The normal internal rate of return, it came to, it was marginally over 14%. And I said that it's quite common to use that as an explanation to say, ah, 14% is greater than the cost of capital, therefore we should accept. But that there were dangers in that. Um, which I'm not going to repeat. Go back and read or listen again if you need. Well, the examiner suggested that an alternative, there's an alternative way of looking at the internal rate of return, which I'll say is much, much quicker and to an extent solves those problems. It's called a modified internal rate of return and you're given the formula for it on the formula sheet. Now it's on page it's printed on page 49 of the notes, but it's given on your formula sheet. Uh, the only problem, as usual with these exams, is that you're not told what the symbols mean. And so it's a question of learning what the symbols mean, and then, of course, making sure you can use your calculator. Well, uh, it's printed on page 49, but let's look. Let's look through these symbols, what they mean, and let me use our example to explain what we mean in each case. First of all, PVR and PVI, these are the present values of what we call, first of all, PVR, the return phase. And in the case of PVI, what we call the investment phase. In both cases, the present value at the cost of capital. Now, let me explain what we mean by this. Surely any project which we consider will involve investing money in order, hopefully, later to receive money back to get a return. If you look at our example, surely in the first year we invested 
2,000. And why did we invest 2,000? So that in later years, we could get back, we could get a return of those cash flows there. And so it's the same with any project. That you'll invest money, whether it just be one investment is here at time zero, or maybe you invest money over one or two years. But you invest money, and then in later years, you'll be getting a return well, we call those, the period where you're investing money, we call the investment phase. And the period where you're getting your return, we call this period here the return phase. So the investment phase is where you've got your cash outflows at the beginning of the project, the return phase, your cash inflows later. Now, I do appreciate, in case any of you are wondering, that you could, in fact, have complications in this in real life. There can be situations where this gets very messy, uh, where perhaps you invest money, then you get a return, and then in a few years you invest more money, and so on. Well, the examiner acknowledges that can happen, but it won't happen in your exam. All that will happen in your exam, you'll invest at the beginning. It may be just one year as it is here, or maybe it's the first two or the first three years. But you'll invest at the beginning, and then all the future years, all the later years, you'll get your cash inflow. It'll be your return phase. So that's what we mean. And for the formula, we need the present values of each at the cost of capital. Well, of course, we've already done all the work. Um, we've done the discounting at the cost of capital. And so the present value of the investment phase is 2,000. So there's present value of the investment phase. The present value of the return phase well, again, we've done the discounting. Here are our returns. The present value of those, well, we've done it earlier and I haven't written down here, but let me write down. Well, you probably spotted there's a quick way anyway. Sorry, I should have written down earlier, but never mind. So, sorry, those are the present values we had earlier. Well, the present value of the um, return phase, add those up, and the total of those, of course, is 2258. Now, by all means, add them up in your calculator, but if you're awake, surely since the net present value is 258, since we know the investment phase is 2,000, present value of the return phase must be 2,258. However, I hope that's clear. We want the present values in each case at the cost of capital, which here is 10%, of the investment phase, return phase. And as I say, given that you'd always have effectively done the MPV first, there's so far virtually no extra work involved. Anyway, let's write that down. Present value of the return phase is 2258. Present value of the investment phase was 2000. What else do we need? Well, in the formula, uh, we've also got N. Well, N is simply the life of the project in years. Uh, and of course, here, no problem, and it won't be in the exam. This project lasts five years. Finally, RE is the cost of capital. And for our example, remember, it was example one again. For our example, it's 10% or 0.1. 
And so now it's simply a case of putting the figures in the formula and making sure that you can use your calculator. So MIRR, present value return phase, 2258, divided by present value investment phase, 2000, to the power 1 over N, 1 over 5, times um, 1 plus RE, well RE is the cost of capital point 0.1, so times 1.1, and then the whole thing minus 1. The only thing to make sure you are happy with on your calculator is the first bit that 2258 over 2000 to the power 1 over 5 it's up to you. It's either to the power 0.2 and given that you must have a scientific calculator that should be no problem. Or if you prefer of course that to the power 5 is the same as the fifth root of that. So either way, you know, it's up to you to play with your calculator. Either do 2258 over 2000 to the power point 2, which is 1 over 5, or do the fifth root of that. It's that times 1.1 1 .1 minus 1, which well, I'll write down in bits uh, to make sure you it's easy for you to check, but 2258 divided by 2000 is 1.129. Uh, the fifth root of 1.129 is 1.02438. which gives us finally 0.1268 or 12.68 percent. Now please for heaven's sake don't uh, write down all those steps in the exam. I was only writing them down to make it easy for you to check if you're not sure about your calculator. Uh, obviously write down that bit to show you know what figures are going where. Uh, the rest of it you should, to be honest, be able to do on your calculator then come straight out with the answer. But there we are. The modified internal rate of return here is 12.68%. Now as I said at the beginning, although it's taken me a while to explain obviously because I was talking through it, it's actually a lot quicker and a lot easier than the normal internal rate of return. Um, it'll virtually always be lower than the standard internal rate of return. If you remember, the ordinary internal rate of return was 14%. Almost always the MRR will be lower. Uh, and it assumes, do you remember I said in the last session that the ordinary IRR effectively assumes that returns are reinvested at the internal rate of return, the MIRR effectively assumes that receipts are reinvested at the cost of capital. Now, of course, the truth uh, is perhaps it might be somewhere in between the, the reinvestment of the receipts but the real advantages of MIR are it's quicker, it's easier, and perhaps the way we use it, it's safer. OK, there's one more thing to look at in this chapter, which is completely separate, nothing to do with the previous three, multi-period capital rationing, but we'll do that in the next session.